So we're going to go over to our next panelist, who is Dr. Corin Mathias. Uh, Corin is a public health physician with a research focus on global mental health. Uh, Corin has worked in India for the last 16 years. Um, she will discuss COVID-19 and the implications for global mental health. Over to you, Corin. Kia ora koutou katoa. Ko Karen Mathias toko ingoa. And I'll just get my screen sharing happening. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about global mental health and focusing on um, the relationship with COVID-19 and a focus on equity. My work in this area has nearly all been in India, so and I've been working there for the last 16 years. So I'll, I'll be using most of my examples from that, and I've just um, completed a study looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on mental health, so I'll also be referring to that. Um, why is mental health important to COVID? And um, yeah, so um, global, global mental health is important because mental health is one of the largest causes of disability globally, and it's particularly important in low and middle income countries. So um, around 32% of the global disease burden is linked to de um, depression and to mental illness, but in low and middle income countries, it goes up to 85%. And um, it's also important when we look at suicide, uh, it's one of the second highest causes of death globally among people under 30. So just sort of reminding ourselves, and um, I've got a photo here of Mina, who's one of our community health volunteers in the project that I've been directing in the Indian Himalayas. And um, using face masks is important, and I'll, I'm using a few illustrations through this presentation of work that teams are doing in communities in low-income countries and with the team that I've been part of in India. Um, I think it's also really important to remember why mental health is important broadly to, to all forms of health. Um, there's no health without mental health and because if you're not mentally healthy you can't choose healthy behaviours, you often don't access services, you're not able to work, you're not able to participate as an active citizen. Those are all really important reasons for looking after mental health. And mental health interventions are also great value for money, which economists and policy makers are happy about. And um, it's also really important to know that most of the improvements in mental health can happen with psychosocial responses. We don't need mental health professionals. And, um, and so those are all good reasons why, why we need to really ensure that we focus on mental health. In the COVID-19 crisis, um, there's three really strong focuses of mental health. And um, the first sort of flurry of publications that came out were building on the SARS epidemic, on the foot and mouth epidemic in England. Um, and we know that people get an increased incidence of mental health problems. And, and other just psychosocial conditions in a humanitarian disaster, which, you know, which we're experiencing globally. Um, particularly, there are increased rates of depression and anxiety being diagnosed, and in conflict settings, more uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. But the other really important thing is the impacts on access to care and um, the impacts on people and institutions. And clearly the impacts of both the pandemic, but also, and probably more importantly, in most of the world, the impacts on the control measures like containment are really significant. Um, for example, the project that I've been working with, uh, with a large NGO in India, the Emmanuel Hospital Association, we've got around 1,200 people with mental illness who um, have been registered and part of our community-based support. And since the outbreak, since the start of lockdown in India, none of the hospitals have managed to keep their mental health um, drug supply chains going. And so many people with epilepsy and schizophrenia and um, depression have been without medicines now for over two months. And so this has been a really huge impact and um, is, is largely undocumented. 
some of our community workers have also been involved in supplying rations because a huge impact in India of the lockdown has been um, just loss of access to income and, and people actually going hungry. Um, this, this headline from the Guardian on the um, slide here show is, is one that um, is alarming and I think all of us probably have experienced some mental health impacts of, of the COVID-19 outbreak. Probably all of us have had some times of feeling deep fear in our stomachs um, but also just feeling very anxious and this is this is really widespread and so and again there's sort of three levels of where the psychosocial impacts are occurring. One is directly in response to the outbreak and we're worried about our family and our own selves and our access to care. Um, in the mission hospital where I was working in March there was a large kind of team meeting about how many ventilators would be kept for staff and how many would be available for patients and, and these are real concerns um, and particularly in settings where there's very little intensive care support. But other things that were also that are also really important is the impact on of the control measures. So um, social isolation particularly for families and people who are single family pressures and then the immediate economic impacts. And then we're all, we're all looking down the barrel of uh, probably quite a number of years of, of economic impacts. And I guess importantly, we know that the poorest and the socially excluded will be most impacted. Um, this group of women on the right here, um, I was interviewing for another research project last year but they capture a lot of what we understand about the equity issues. And I know that some other speakers have, have referred to these on these already, um, but these are women who are largely, um, have had very limited education or are not literate. They're female, which is by itself a um, social determinant of poor health. They live in a rural area with limited access to healthcare and they're from a minority ethnic group. And this is, they typify much of what we see in um, mental health globally, that there's a strong social gradient, but, and there's groups who are disproportionately impacted. An example of this um, is a study that I did a couple of years ago in Uttarakhand, which was looking at risk of depression. And we looked at that associated with years of completed education. And we can see that um, people who have completed secondary school education are um, using them as the reference that people who haven't completed are four times more likely to develop depression. And there's a quite strong dose response relationship there related to years of completed schooling. So it's just reminding us that social determinants are significant. I'm going to just take um, a few minutes now to talk about a study that I just submitted last week. Um, and what we were examining was what are the mental health impacts among disadvantaged groups in North India during the COVID lockdown, but also what are some of the coping strategies? What were the, what are the practices that increase coping and resilience? Um, to do the study, we interviewed 24 people. So I've been in New Zealand since um, the first day of lockdown, I arrived back from India. And so um, I was able to join in some of the interviews by WhatsApp and um, was working with two colleagues who um, conducted the interviews, some face-to-face -face and some by phone. We focused on people with disability, and among those were three people who have intellectual disability, and we interviewed their carers. Um, eight people living in slums with mental health problems, and eight widows living in a rural area. Um, just briefly, the area where I've been working and where we did the study is in the state of Uttarakhand. It's in the hilly um, Indian Himalaya. It, the people living there, the average um, poverty level is higher than that in India. There's very, very sparse access to mental health services. So there's only seven government psychiatrists and six of those are in, in two big cities. So um, and the COVID-19 situation there is, um, really rapidly increasing. There were 91 cases at the start of this month and there are now, um, yesterday there was 2,533. 2, um, 
the sort of overview of what we found was was that there were the probably the biggest impacts, but also the bigger the important levels of response were at an intrapersonal level. People um, finding new dimensions between local and global, where you're stuck in a very local place, but maybe feeling more locally, globally collect, connected than they had before. The so social isolation was severe, but then that was also using telephones. That was the sort of a key strategy for coping. And then some really important social and environmental impacts and um, coping responses. So I'll just go through a couple of these. I haven't got time to go through all of them. One of them was that feeling bewildered and overwhelmed was a very widespread experience, but it was particularly so for people with um, less access to telephone, to information, to mobiles and to TVs. And so we had several widows in our, um, who we interviewed who, who felt really bewildered. They didn't know what was happening and they described having to sort of shout over the gate to the neighbors and ask what's happening and what do I do? And this really sort of highlighted the access, the sort of technology barriers which exacerbate the inequalities um, so that people, people without phones particularly didn't know what was going on. This quote here from a 40 year old man with disability, I, I think in a way captures how many of us feel that um, from a disease that we didn't had only heard about perhaps in January or late December has now eclipsed everything else. And this person says, now we have no dengue and malaria and other diseases we used to have in summer. There's only one disease and all other diseases have vanished. Another really important impact that we have observed, and I know it's been discussed elsewhere, is the social distancing and the risk of contamination and infection has bred, bred a growing mistrust of others. And um, I guess that this is particularly evident in India. Um, a number of health workers have been not allowed to return to their homes and communities. And I was just talking to one of my colleagues yesterday who's been asked by her landlord to move house because she's working with people in slums and because she's coming and going, they're saying, we don't want you to rent this house anymore. Um, in India, there were some very big riots between Hindu and Muslim people in February. And um, this has added on to that to really increase the kind of communalism. And this example here of a 30 year old woman who um, a Hindu woman living in a slum describes that before the her neighbor would say to Mary Dharam Kabhin Ho, meaning you used to be my sister in faith, but now saying that we really don't trust each other and we no longer talk to each other. So this is a really significant finding. Another really important impact that we've observed is that the socioeconomic impacts have just been huge for some people. And um, when some of the, particularly the widows that we interviewed were, were literally going hungry. They, this woman described that they only had rice oil and tea leaves, that they were hungry and how she'd gone to the market with just one repeat to borrow money. And this woman, it's really important to understand that the axes of disadvantage compound. And so this person who was a woman, who was a widow, who had a child with a disability, who didn't have land and who was illiterate, had these kind of compounding events which were leading her to complete despair. And I think um, this really highlighted to us, and, and I think it's important for all of us to completely complete understanding the importance of qualitative research and of social sciences. Um, when we ask surveys and have our preset questions, we don't hear the impacts for people who experience multiple disadvantage um, as this woman did. Um, if we go on to look at some of the coping measures, um, there's some really great and creative responses and nearly all of the participants, even those in the most desperate situation, were also showing great creativity and ways of responding. Um, one really clear re um, area that came out was that natural resources and natural places were solace and places for people to recover. And when people were in slums, they talked about sitting on the balcony and watching the sunset as being the time they could forget about COVID. 
this example here talks about taking the goats grazing to remember that a place time to remember that COVID isn't happening. Um, there was very much big picture thinking and um, people describing that because this event was happening all over the world at the time of these interviews, India was um, way down in the kind of league table of responses. It's now number four. But people were saying, well, the, you know, even the Americans and the Europeans, they're having a bad time and, you know, we're all in this together. And so I know I need to also cope with it. Um, and this wheelchair user described about, I know I've managed in hard times before, so I know I can manage now. So there's a lot of, lot of really people finding benefit and finding ways to move forward. There's a really strong theme that emerged also around coping and um, the use of communications and mobile phones and how people, um, this 18 year old said, if there were no mobile phones, then God knows how people would have kept themselves going and entertained. They would have died from missing their own people. Um, so those are just some of the findings. And I guess reflecting on those and on the go ongoing cases in, in India, um, the doubling time is around 20, um, 20 days. Um, there's a, nearly half a million now, and it's, it's not showing any signs of slowing. And I think it's really important for us to sort of pay attention to what we can learn from qualitative research and um, particularly to listen to and lis you know, seek out data to attend to the voices on the edges and the marginalized. Um, to make sure that our responses are inclusive and universal. And an example of this is that the um, and all the initial apps that came out in India for COVID were not usable for people with visual or hearing disabilities. And that it's really important to act with available and local resources. Um, just some really basic public mental health measures that um, New Zealand has done a great job of implementing by and large but clear messaging, honest messaging, promoting communication, and rather than talking about social distancing, focusing on physical distancing, but, but staying, staying in touch with people. Um, I think really important to ensure that the most excluded and most disadvantaged are most able to access support and addressing stigma. These are all really key measures and, um, and haven't been happening enough in many countries. I think another really important idea is that in times of peace, we need to have really strong structures so that we can then move forward. And so if people have got in communities have skills for psychosocial care um, to, look, to know how to look after themselves, then there's a better chance of being well in a situation like an epidemic. This is a really great um, resource that WHO, I think sort of fast tracked, it just came out in May but it's an illustrated guide. It's very simple language and gives really great ideas on how to manage stress and respond um, and, and look after yourself in times of stress. And it really focuses on psychosocial skills, which you can use at home. It, it's not dependent on professionals or medicines. So um, just as I wrap up, some of the responses that I think are really important to see in global mental health and there's been some really useful Lancet articles identifying what are the you know big information needs that we need to include in mental health and one of these is that when we use co-productive and participatory methods to generate knowledge and to implement plans there's a much higher chance that the knowledge is, is useful relevant and acceptable. Um, addressing equity is is really essential and who we have in our teams and where they live and what their experiences is something that we've been finding in our community development and mental health work in India is really important. Um, but also to really avoid deficit type thinking where we only describe negative impacts because there are resources and assets in each setting. Um, a lot of funding decisions are made you know, in Delhi or in Wellington or in Washington. And it's really important to, and you know, what we're finding is that the people in local contexts, there are very different experiences. It's important to recognize those. I think the whole outbreak that is 
you know, for inclusion and anti-racism has been really important and totally wrapped up with the COVID-19 outbreak, particularly linked to George, George Floyd's murder. And um, so I think recognizing the importance of social determinants and again, looking out for those in the ways that we do our research, um, ensuring that data is disaggregated, um, looking at ethnicity and other areas. Um, just to close, I, this is a really great um, opinion piece that was in the Journal of the American Medical Association last month. And I, I think it captures a lot of what all of us working um, to respond to COVID need to think about um, with the much bigger picture and social determinants and equity kind of right on our foreheads. I'll just read it aloud. Um, the work of a physician as a healer cannot stop at the door of an office, the threshold of an operating room, or the front gate of a hospital. The rescue of a society and the restoration of a political ethos that remembers to heal have also become physicians' jobs. Professional science, silence in the face of social injustice is wrong. So um, I'll wrap up there. I'm looking forward to some questions. And yeah, I, I just hope that we can all keep mental health right at the front of our COVID um, response and research and programs. Thanks. Thank you, Corin. A few questions that have come in. Um, First one, are, are these findings from India applicable internationally, for example, in New Zealand or in other Pacific Island nations? Um, I guess global mental health is something that um, tries to look at what's the um, features of mental health and what's happening. And so I think these findings are very relevant, the experiences of disadvantaged communities where they have low resources um, in North India are very similar to many other disadvantaged and low middle income settings. They may be not, um, you know, there's not a perfect match over to high income settings like New Zealand, but the ideas of coping skills that build on existing psychosocial resources um, is very much something that happens all the world over because we're all human beings. Absolutely. Uh, here's a rather big question. In your opinion, what do you think governments could do to improve the mental health of populations in South Asian countries? Oh, this is a favorite topic of mine. I think that um, my personal view, I very strongly believe that building and supporting psychosocial resources and skills in communities is really key. And I think um, building knowledge and awareness is important and um, doing developing those resources in co-productive ways that are relevant and contextually useful is, is central. I think developing um, safe social spaces and um, allowing dialogue around mental health is really important. And so yeah, the role of stigma and social exclusion is really important. Um, access to care is important and care providers who are good at, I, I think that who can understand sort of different explanatory frameworks and a more pluralist understanding. People in um, the communities where I've been working are very able to visit a traditional healer while they take their fluoxetine and while they also, you know, follow, follow the advice of a local IV fluid merchant. And so I think, um, Dua or Dawa, which is a term used often in South Asia, which means prayers and medicine is a really good approach rather than saying, you know, very strictly biomedical approach. It's okay to embrace traditional healers input and recognize that, you know, it's all mental health is quite large and complex. And so it's okay to um, engage with other sort of systems of healing. Um, and I guess that the third area that that I think is really important is group work and psychosocial support groups have got really good evidence. And so we're in, um, I guess, Western or high income settings and one-to-one -one therapy predominates. We actually have found better responses in group therapy. And um, I think that's probably quite relevant for other community groups in New Zealand as well, that we could do well to respond with a um, maybe a less individualistic Western response, but to look at the Fano and Te Whare Tapafa type approaches, which are looking at the kind of whole person and the whole community. 
Interesting insights, thank you. We have a few minutes left and uh, no more questions have come through. So perhaps while we give it a few moments, are there any parts of your presentation you'd like to give a bit more attention to or any additional insights you'd like to share while we get a few more questions through? Sure. Well, I guess that one thing that um, I was really keen to focus on is looking at the ways that people use connectivity. And so one, one of the biggest um, impacts that we were described by participants was in the research that we did was a feeling of social isolation and that they weren't able to use their normal ways of connecting to other people. So um, I guess social connectedness by itself is a health determinant, but particularly the ways that people could talk or communicate changed. But there was also these really sort of innovative ways where um, people described you know, and we saw this in New Zealand, people standing at the end of driveways or um, talking over the fence through the window to neighbours and um, that drive to connect to other people seemed really, really critical, particularly at this time of crisis. And so I think how to facilitate that in policy and in programmes and to let the native um, innovation of, of humankind to allow that to prosper is something that would be really great to kind of support with technology as well. Thank you. And uh, our last question um, is a comment as well. Corin, this is such an amazing webinar, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you so much for your wisdom and encouragement to move away from a deficit model. Do you have any comment relating to Dr. Wall's concern about child and youth mental health in New Zealand during the COVID-19 response? Um, I, th I think that I've, I'm doing quite a lot of work around youth, mental health and youth, and I guess that one of the biggest things I feel like is um, I, I really have not worked in, in, in New Zealand for some years, so I don't feel um, competent to respond on the status of, of child and youth mental health in New Zealand, but to underline that it is it is really core to the well-being of a community is something really important. And um, we've been working with a group of young women in a slum in Derridoon, a city near where I've been living. And they have, they have just had so many insightful ideas on how to respond. We had this amazing event where an 18-year-old Hindu woman joined together with a 24-year-old Muslim woman and they went to the local Sikh temple and they provided food for 30 families twice a day over a week and they did all the collecting food they went around the community collecting food and the sort of levels of energy and innovation that young people show is just is so critical that I, I really would love to find ways that New Zealand was better at allowing youth voices to be at the table in policy making and research design and in program implementation so I, I guess that sort of co-production approach is something that I would really love, you know, all people everywhere to, to do better. Thank you. Yeah. We're probably about out of time, but there's one quick question that's come through. Can we be first world and developed, but still socially connected and personal? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I think, um, I think that, that one of just one of the very strong themes, just going back to this research that we did, was just this amazing thing that has happened with COVID, where a lot of us have been more local than we've ever been in our lives. You know, staying in a you know per, sort of one meet, one kilometer radius of our homes, and in the whole world over, that has been an experience. But more globally connected to the experience of being human, and so I think this is another of the opportunities of COVID if we choose to take it and run with it. So. Um, how that happens, I guess we don't have time to discuss, but I, I think it's one of the amazing opportunities of COVID. Thanks. Indeed. Thank you, Corin. And that's all we have time for today. So thanks once again to Corin and Tony for their presentations and insights. We will be back again tomorrow. And as I'm sure you're aware, our first speaker at 12 noon tomorrow will be Dr. Ashley Bloomfield. So we hope to see you then. Ngamihi.